On Fan Writing. Hello my friends and welcome to On Fan Writing. My name is Duhod and I'm here to talk to you about the art of writing, especially as it pertains to fan fiction. Now before we get into the subject properly, I want to go over a few things. Starting with why I'm doing this and why you should care. There's a lot of sources you can go to in order to learn how to write fiction. Some good, some bad, some expensive, and some, like this one, are free. But most are focused on writing original pieces. That's more than fair, as you can't sell fanfiction as far as most uh, definitions of respectable forms of writing go. Well, fanfiction tends to scrape the bottom of the barrel in most people's books. So why teach people to write in a form that generally gets very little respect? Two reasons. The first of which is that fanfiction in and of itself is not a bad thing. Many famous authors have written stories that were based on or set in the worlds of other writers. Manly Wade Wellman was one of several authors who wrote unofficial sequels to H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. Kevin J. Anderson has made a career at writing official pieces of fanfiction. Hundreds of H.P. Lovecraft stories have been written, many quite good, and most fans would agree that there are far better Star Wars novels than the prequel trilogy. Heck, if that's not high enough for you, then why don't you take a look at Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy. I'm sorry, but you can't tell me that the story of Dante himself going on a trip through the whole of the afterlife, meeting all of his favorite characters from history and religion, and even getting the chance to see the people he did not like getting stuck in hell is not self-insert fanfiction. The second reason for doing this is that I honestly think there's a slightly different set of skills you need to write fanfiction. When writing an original work, it's up to the writer to make the world believable, to make the characters feel real, and to develop interesting traits that will make them stand out to the readers and help said readers get emotionally invested. When you write fanfiction, you still have some of those concerns, but instead of building a world in characters, you're trying to capture the feel of a pre-existing world and set of characters. The challenge of creating new and interesting characters becomes the challenge of bringing characters that the reader already likes or hates and making them feel familiar and real to the reader while still giving them something new or different. The challenge of creation replaced by the balancing act of giving the reader something they can't get from the original but without straying so far from the original that it stops being recognizable to them as a thing they wanted more of in the first place. Oh, and I suppose sometimes they're there because they hate the thing your story is about and they want to see it torn apart for their amusement or sense of vindication. But even then, you need to make it feel close enough to the original so they get what they want from your attack on it. As for my own qualifications, they mostly boil down to a lot of hands-on experience writing and editing these type of projects and a few years of college education minoring in creative writing and media studies. For critical analysis. And for what it's worth, I'm also a teacher, though, to be fair, creative writing and history are not exactly the same subject. Well, if you're still here, let's break this thing down and get to it. 1. Plot. Oh, get your mind out of the gutter, would you? Your story's plot is a tricky beast to handle. A lot of new writers, and a few experienced writers I've known, will go into their stories with their whole storyline thought out in their head. They have a beginning, they have a middle, and most importantly, they have a super emotional, action-packed, movingly romantic ending set up in their head long before they set pen to paper or fingers to keyboard. <clears throat> Almost inevitably, these types of stories run to one of two problems in my experience. They either, one, feel very stiff and ungainly because the writer wrote the story with certain milestones in mind, and they wrote it to try and hit those milestones and force the narrative out of its natural flow in order to make sure they hit those points because those points need to be there for the ending they wanted, or the entire story just falls apart and dies before they even reach the ending because they wanted to get to the ending so badly that the only thing they really were focused on was that point. And when the challenge of trying to fill in all the bits in between the milestones they needed to hit and the finale became too much of a hassle to write around, they either just threw up their hands and quit or, you know, forced the narrative to just skip ahead right to the ending because that was the part they were interested in writing. Now, this is no way to say that that style of writing is totally invalid. In fact, it works great for short stories where you're able to plan out the entire thing over the shorter length of the narrative. Nor should you throw out planning altogether. Not planning at all can lead to the other extreme problem of having your story meander about because you have no idea where the ending actually is, and you end up with a story that just goes on and on without actually doing anything. 
An example of the more naturalistic storytelling style not working so well is Stephen King. I love his work to death. His book on writing was basically my Bible in college. Uh, but as much as he's a great proponent and in some ways a really good example of a more naturalistic style of storytelling, most of his books, especially later on, tend to run into the problem where around the middle, the books will kind of wander off in odd directions, largely unrelated to the central conflict. And anyone who's read The Stand or The Dark Tower or It or Dreamcatcher or Doom McKee can attest to the fact that his stories often end in ways that make it pretty clear he had no idea exactly where he was going to end them until he would basically reached the end. I would say the best method of determining where you personally should write your stories on this line between pre-planned pre structure and writing as a more naturalistic stream of consciousness it will depend largely on how you are as a writer and, more importantly, the nature of the story i.e. a slice of life romantic yarn could probably benefit from more naturalistic writing in terms of character interaction since you don't want to make it all st stiff and formal though you do want to be careful to make sure that certain key events will happen pre-planned out so that you can continue the story and it doesn't end up in a quagmire On another good example of the more naturalistic style of working well would be a Tolkien-esque winding tale of travel in the spirit of The Hobbit, where the creativity of a more naturalistic flow allows you to come up with the places that the characters see along the road. Though, again, keeping in mind that you should probably plan things out a little bit, because if your world breaks its internal consistency, it will run into the problem that your readers will be pulled out of the experience because you put in less thought about the world and how it all fit together than they did and now they're seeing the cracks in the story. So, even in the more naturalistic styles of storytelling, you still want to keep a little bit of structure. Alternatively, if you are writing a mystery or political thriller, you will need to do a lot of planning because then you need to be able to have a story with a lot of internal consistency, but also one where both the story is vague enough that the reader does not figure out what the mystery is until the end, but also in, also fair enough with this information that once they reach the end, they will go, aha, it all makes sense to me now, as opposed to going, no, no, that there wasn't enough information for that. That's BS. I don't, no, that doesn't work. I feel cheated. A good rule of thumb for these situations is if you don't need to worry about exactly what is being said and when it, things are taking place, leaving yourself a little bit of room to let the characters interact more naturally with one another is probably going to be good. But, if the story does not work unless certain things happen, make sure that those things happen when they need to happen in the narrative. And if you reach a point where the narrative stops working because something needs to happen that cannot happen within the rules of the characters in the universe, then your story has reached a point where it is broken and you need to go back and reevaluate it, not try and force those events to happen. Next, remember that every action in the story should be driven by the actions that came before it, and those actions should, in turn, lead to the next actions that occur. It, this may seem somewhat obvious, but try and think about it like this. Every story should go, this happened, which led to this happening, so then that this happened as opposed to this happened, then this happened, then this happened. The difference is a good story has everything happening for a reason. Every action that occurs, every event that occurs is the result, at least to some extent, of what happened before. And every action that comes after it, every event that comes after it, happens because of the things that happened before that point. A bad story is one where things happen and then other things happen with no real relation to the things that happened before it. Finally, almost more important than narrative flow is this final rule about writing your story. The actions of the characters should be consistent with the characters. If the story to progress requires the brave knight to hide in a bush at the first sign of danger so that he can see the villain without getting killed, even though it contradicts everything we know about his character up to this point, your story is broken. If the coward needs to rush into a dangerous situation in order to save someone they should not care enough about to risk their life because that's the only way for the uh, story to progress because they need that person alive to get the information they need to progress the story, your story is broken. 
Characters should not ever act out of character in order to progress the story, not without a good explanation. This goes double for fanfiction, because if you break the original characterization, people will notice far more quickly than if you were just using original characters. They might write off an out-of-character moment with an original character as saying something that you'll explain later on. You'll have to explain it later on, but they might at least accept it. With, an ori with a character that you are taking from an original source, that is not yours, that the people who are reading are aware of, they will pick up on those inconsistencies much faster and be much less forgiving of these out-of-character moments. Furthermore, if the actions are out-of-character on a canonical character, and they are done out-of-character for the obvious benefit of another character, or in order to, you know, gain audience sympathy for another character, that's going to be setting off a lot of people's Mary Sue alarms. We'll get into original characters and Mary Sue's a little bit later in the next section. So how do you fix this problem? Work out the situation so the story can progress without breaking the characters. Think about it this way. If the story can only progress if it's snowing, and your characters are in the middle of the desert, then you either have to figure out a way of getting them out of the desert, or figure out how you can progress the story without it snowing. In a story, the rules of how characters behave are just as important as those that govern the world around them. Part 2. Characters. Well, you have a story in mind, more or less, and you're ready to start wowing your friends and internet strangers alike with your tales of adventure, romance, and detailed explanations as to why the Tribbles could totally beat the Ewoks in a fight. The only problem is, no one likes your story. They can't connect to the characters, and because they can't connect to the characters, they can't, you know, feel invested in the story. So, what do? This is a question that could easily take up an entire series all on its own, and is not helped by the nature of fandom, since not only do you have to write characters who are believable and relatable, they also have to feel recognizable to the original versions that the fans are familiar with. Adding to this is the fact that what makes a good character can be somewhat subjective. Superman and Goku are classics of US and Japanese popular culture who have resonated as strong moral idealistic figures who we are meant to kind of strive towards, but they're so far beyond the average person, both in their morals and in their abilities, that they're hardly relatable to most of us, at least on, you know, that side of things. Then there's the opposite. There are, things, there are shows like It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia and the classic Seinfeld, which have casts of characters who become so incredibly vile uh, that it would take a borderline sociopath to really properly see eye to eye with them. The key here is simple. Keep the characters believable. Try and keep in mind their thought processes, the way their minds work, how smart they are, and what guides them. This will tell you how they should react, or shouldn't react, to certain events and other characters. Even if the character isn't meant to be on the same level as the reader, the reader should be able to understand why they do what they do. Even if the character is so high above them on moral level, or so far below them on the basis levels of human nature, there should be able to be a way for the reader to understand why they do the things they do. This is especially important with villains, since it's important to keep in mind that even an incredibly morally bankrupt character doesn't have a motivation to do bad things just because they are themselves bad. Most people consider themselves to be the good guy, or at least have some sort of way of justifying their own actions in their own heads. Keep in mind that if you want to avoid creating a bland antagonist or generically evil army, that you need to keep in mind that even the bad guys have their motivations. No one decides to go around burning protagonists' hometowns to the ground just because they're feeling particularly evil that day. And for that matter, you should keep that in mind when creating your good guys as well. Just because the rebels slash good kingdom slash cops slash citizens of the protagonist's home nation are on the hero's side, that does not constitute a proper explanation as to why they're all clean, nice, friendly, and wholesome, and everyone on the evil guy's side are cowardly, evil, nasty, grubby, dirty people. Of course, you can tell a story with very simple good and evil characters and a very simple morality system, but readers aren't going to empathize particularly strongly with uh, characters whose defining personalities are generic evil and generic good. But, again, these are the side characters. Let's get into the main characters. 
Now obviously just like with the supporting cast, your main cast needs to be believable, but unlike the supporting cast, these characters will be front and center to the readers and will be under much closer scrutiny. The same rules will apply here in terms of needing to keep them relatable, while also being able to make them slightly higher and lower on the moral scale than the average person. But details will matter. While like little protagonist is not necessary, having someone who's utterly contemptible spearheading your story will probably not work either. Even when working with a story with an unlikable hero, it's important to make uh, the main character at least relatable or pitiable enough that the reader is not driven away by the idea of reading about your leads or lead. Keep in mind that works with unlikable main characters, Always Sunny in Philadelphia, Mog World, Black Adder, Spec Ops The Line, tend to balance out the fact that you're watching despicable people by having them fail as often or more often than they succeed so that the audience can enjoy the catharsis of seeing bad people get what's coming to them as a reminder that the writer or writers are on the same page as them. This is important because if the audience is failing to relate to the characters because they're unlikable, they can at least relate to the writers of the piece because they'll have the implicit understanding that both the writers, the creators, and themselves are more or less in agreement on the fact that these are terrible people who should not succeed in the end. This of course works in reverse as well. Any character that is too good will have trouble relating to audience members outside of children because an absolute moral authority will be at best boring and at worst preachy. Human beings make mistakes and when they do they either fix them, hide from them, or face the consequences of them. A character who does not make mistakes, or one who never faces consequences for their mistakes, will be seen as unrealistic, dull, and have a hard time connecting with readers as anything other than a consequence-free fantasy. On this point, there's another problem that you need to avoid that involves characters' ability to accomplish tasks. Once again, there are two extremes that you need to avoid here. On the one hand, you have protagonists who can't do anything. They're dumb, losers in love, and can't seem to do anything right. Unless you're writing a Woody Allen-esque comedy of errors, this kind of character tends to get grating fast, since unless the story is targeted towards self-loathing high schoolers, most people will find it hard to really relate to a self-loathing protagonist. This also goes for side characters who seem to only be there to make the hero look good by comparison, and villains who never seem to succeed due to their pure, utter incompetence. On the other side of the competency scale, you have the far more iconic problem of the Mary Sue. A Mary Sue, also sometimes called a Gary or Marty Stew of the character's male, is a hyper-competent ubermensch, perfect in just about every way the writer feels is important. Now I'm going to assume if you've made it this far, you have enough sense in your head to understand why writing a character whose description reads, he's like Superman except stronger with Batman's utility belt, who's currently dating a Nobel Prize winning supermodel, is not a great idea. Most people who do create characters like this are probably in it more for self-gratification and living vicariously through their characters than for trying to write an actual story, and they'll most likely grow out of this type of storytelling after they leave middle school. Most writers, especially ones with any sense of internet savvy, know more than enough to avoid these type of severe suit traits when creating characters but will often fall into the trap of superficially patching over the problems by giving the characters flaws to balance them out, while still leaving them unbeatably competent in the areas that they feel are important. For instance, a character who is constantly described as brooding or troubled, who has trouble relating to others and is constantly being picked on by mean-spirited characters, often canonical characters who the writer didn't like, but who is still immediately fawned over by the rest of the cast and is shown to be right in just about every situation in which they care to weigh in on, is probably still a Sue. No matter how many times they cry about how they are bad and unworthy of the love that's heaped on them from the rest of the cast. Another bad sign would be any character who can beat anyone else in a fight, especially in a setting that prior to their arrival did not have a lot of fighting in it, probably is straying pretty far into power fantasy territory for the writer. And finally, if your character is you, or could be easily described as you, but as a vampire, or Super Saiyan, or ninja, or pony, or robot. Even if it's not actually you, but just someone who is an awful lot like you, do try and take a moment to seriously ask yourself if what you're writing is a story or an excuse to show the world what an amazing person you are or would be in this situation. Because chances are the story is not going to end well for either your readers who are not going to enjoy reading someone else's power fantasy, 
or your ego for when they leave nasty comments and reviews. Now having said that, I'm going to give you the slightly contradictory sounding advice of always write what you know in terms of characters. Yeah, there are definitely problems when your protagonist who is just like you, but better, than Batman. Uh, but if, the thing is, if you can write a character who is like yourself, while divorcing yourself from them enough that it doesn't just end up you, as you projecting yourself onto them, you can use your own sense of morality and your own judgment as a barometer of normalcy when trying to determine how a character should act and what a character says in any given situation. Basically, when writing a scene with a character, try and think about what motivates them, how they think, and then ask yourself, if I was this person in this situation, what would I do? What would a person who is more like this character do? Doing this can go a long way towards preventing your readers from scratching their head constantly in confusion at the actions and thought processes of your protagonist, and can help avoid making the villain seem like an idiot who makes really obvious mistakes just so the hero can exploit them to save the day. Now though we've only just scratched the tip of the iceberg, that's all the time we have for characters for right now. So let's move forward and talk about how to get our story to feel right in our next segment, part 3, Tone. This is where things start to get a little bit tricky and very dependent upon the type of story and the source material. So remember that we're painting with broad strokes here. Lots of important little details will be lost, but hopefully we'll have a chance to deal with those at a later date. Tone is the mode that you, the writer, set with your story. It's the sum of the story, dialogue, characterization, world, and most other elements that go into the story, and it is very easy to mess up. Before you write a story, you need to know the tone that you want to set with it. Once you've determined if your story is dark or light, funny or sad, you can have a better idea as to the general parameters you'll be writing in. Once this tone is established, keep, try and keep it in mind while you're developing your characters and setting. Since a dark setting where mega corporations rule with an iron fist and class struggles permeate the, every facet of the world and culture would probably not be an appropriate setting for a lighthearted romantic comedy starring the children of corporate executives. Since the tone of a romantic comedy, especially a lighthearted romantic comedy, would clash rather badly with the dark tone of the setting. However, you can do that sort of light romantic comedy story if you acknowledge the dissonance between the setting and story and play with it, say by having the petty problems of the protagonist just opposed against uh, the suffering of the masses to make a point about first world problems taken to an extreme, and thus making it a sort of dark satirical comedy. This works the other way too, naturally. If you're telling a lighthearted story about high school kids who are in an interstate martial arts tournament in a wacky 90s style lighthearted comedy, then revealing that the main character's mom is dead and that she died of cancer as a means of generating audience sympathy is going to create a horrible tonal shift unless it's managed in the most delicate way possible. I have lost track of the number of times I've seen relatively lighthearted stories suddenly pull a Batman and have one of their characters reveal that they've been emotionally scarred from a young age by the tragic and often brutal deaths of family. Bonus Mary Sue points if they mention that they feel responsible for not being able to save them due to some variation of not being strong enough. Now of course these are extreme examples, but even smaller things can really hurt your story by damaging the tone. Indiana Jones kills a lot of people, and his adventures are often filled with scary things that are certainly not appropriate for all ages. But there's still certain levels of light and dark that they will not go to in an Indiana Jones story. Dr. Jones is not going to save a puppy from a burdening building while lecturing a bad guy about the evils of drugs, but nor will he shoot a Nazi in the neck and then let him slowly suffocate on his own blood. And for that matter, rape as a plot point or backstory would almost certainly never show up in an Indiana Jones story because it would bring a level of grimness to the story that's just not an appropriate match. And while we're talking about, you know, established universes, remember we are writing fan fiction here, which means you also have to keep in mind the tone of the original source material. What's right for Fallout is not necessarily what's right for Saints Row. Without creating an extensive list of all the fandoms you could possibly be writing in, let's just lay down a few ground rules. 1. Think about the original tone of the thing you're working from. If it's funny, think about what kind of humor is used, and if it's dramatic, Think about what happens in it that makes it compelling drama. Well, you don't have to follow the rules of the series as they are presented, 
always keep them in mind. Simply darkening or lightening a setting in characters without context is never an appropriate way of changing the tone. 2. If you intend to shift the tone of the piece, then carefully think about the justification for why there is a tonal shift. The readers will presumably know where the original material stood in terms of its tone, and will have a hard time shaking that knowledge when reading your story without good justification. If you're picking out a darker element of a light story, and playing out the horrible implications of it, then explain why the thing is so dark, why its presence did not darken the original story, and why it's doing so now in your work. I.e., if you want to tell a story about a funny character dealing with the emotional abuse suffered from his upbringing that was hinted at, but not fully explored in an episode of the show, then explain why the character has not been visibly suffering from the abuse before, and why he or she is doing so now. Because they are, is not an answer. 3. Don't change the history and nature of the setting or characters purely to facilitate a tonal shift. Making all the characters jerks so that they can be uncharacteristically mean to the protagonist, or arbitrarily giving a villain a hitherto unmentioned backstory that justifies all their actions and makes them suddenly a good guy from now on, is just insulting to the source material. Remember that you have chosen to work in a setting and with characters created by another person or creative team, and that both you and the people who are reading your story have been brought to this point by the love of that original material. If you have to warp it just to make your story work, then you might as well not have bothered writing in a pre-existing setting in the first place. Now, this is not to say that you can't change the setting or characters, but there must be a reason behind that change, and the reason has to be thought out. Writing a story where Ron Weasley is a terrible person, either because he's suddenly become so, or, or just because in this story he's always been so, with the reaction of the other characters being simply to shun him, that's just lazy writing. A story where Ron starts as he does in the books, but then slowly, you know, degrades to the point where he becomes a jerk throughout the course of the story due to logical in-universe reasons, on the other hand, could make for an interesting story. As could a story where he starts as a jerk, but it's a character study about why this version of the character is a jerk, or why the version that we know could be perceived as a jerk under different circumstances. The same goes for setting or plot. A story where the cast of Breaking Bad is in the land of My Little Pony or Revolutionary America with no explanation is just ludicrous. A story that reimagines and retools Breaking Bad's core uh, story and characters into forms that would work in Revolutionary War America, or a story that works with the characters of My Little Pony to move them into positions where they would be able to play out Breaking Bad but with different characters in alternate situations, obviously, while still being incredibly silly, could work. It could be potentially very interesting. Execution is everything here. Think it out and you have an interesting what-if story. Half-ass it and you just end up with a story that's weird and alienating to the target demographic, aka the people who like the thing that you're writing fanfiction of. Wrapping up. Now, there's a lot more that could and honestly should be said about the subject of writing, but consider this an overview of three of the more important topics to keep in mind when you begin writing. While there are other, more comprehensive guides out there, and if you really want to improve your craft, you should probably look into checking out some more of them, if you keep these guidelines in mind, you should be able to avoid a lot of new writer pitfalls and spare yourself the indignation of getting a mailbox full of scathing reviews about how terrible your stories are. And finally, I'm going to give you two last pieces of advice that might be even more important than everything else I've said so far, even if they sound a little bit cliché. First, practice makes perfect. If you're going to improve, you've got to keep on writing. Even if you have some duds when you start out, you're still going to learn from your mistakes as long as you're willing to look at your work critically and understand where you've made mistakes and improve from those. That is the best way to become a better writer. Second, and related to the first, is to not be afraid of your critics. Family and friends can make excellent pre-readers. Pre-readers are people who check your story to make sure there are no glaring spelling and story mistakes that you missed simply because you were too close to your story, which, believe me, happens to the best of us. But if you want an honest opinion, then bite the bullet and post your story on whatever site hosts the kind of fanfiction you write. Not gonna lie to you, and say that your story probably won't be called crap and you won't get harassed by at least someone. But, more often than not, you'll be able to get at least some useful feedback from even the harshest comments. Then you could get lucky and actually have some people comment who are legitimately trying to help you with, you know, helpful reviews. Just remember that even if everyone's saying that your characters are stupid or gay, 
That does not mean that you should take what they're saying to heart and lose, you know, faith in yourself as a writer. But you can look at that and ask yourself, why are so many people having trouble connecting to my characters in a meaningful way? If the vast majority of them are saying, your story is boring, then try and look at why they're not getting engaged in the narrative. The first response most people will have to this kind of feedback will be to reject it, especially if it's negative and unconstructive. But if you can look past the personal slights and find out why the majority of your readers like or didn't like parts of the story, and where large minority groups liked or did not like things, you can start to get a rough idea as to where you need to improve and where you're actually doing alright. Now that's all the time we have for right now, but hopefully this will help you in your future writing endeavors. Also, stick around, because I'm not done talking about writing just yet, and I'm working on a few things that you guys might just enjoy. So stay tuned to this channel, as well as my own, to see that. At any rate, this has been Duhad, and until next time, good luck, and have fun writing.